2022 marks the 120th year since the first meeting of the Honolulu Engineering Association was held in the old YMCA on Hotel Street. Engineers and Architects of Hawaii maintains an archive of our 120 year story. The following video is part of EAH's community outreach on Olelo Channel 53. In this meeting, Chuck Merkel, Executive Director of the Pacific Fleet Submarine Memorial Association, presents the history of the USS Bowfin Submarine SS-287. He speaks of the development of the fleet submarines during the Second World War and up to the Navy's current nuclear submarines. We're going to get started here at uh, room 301 in Matapa Tower, Engineers and Architects Hawaii. I'm uh, Sam Gilly, uh, Secretary. Our President Bill Blackman is under the weather today and so will not be joining us. Okay, uh, Sam, you want to introduce our speaker? Uh, sure. Sure, I, uh, I'm, I'm the, I guess, the speaker host for the month of March and uh, happy to introduce our presenter today. Uh, you know, I'm Sam Danwick from Kaufman Engineers and I'm uh, also serving on the board. And I like to say the Bowfin board, but, but I'm, I really have to learn this name because I, <laughs> I have to read it. The Pacific Fleet Submarine Memorial Association. And today we have the executive director of, of our association, uh, Captain Charles K. Chuck Merkel, U.S. Navy, retired. And again, he's our executive director, has been, been in that position since 2016. And he's gonna he's gonna talk about some of the great things that that the association has done with with the museum and and uh, the Bowfin. Uh, a little bit about about Captain Merkel's uh, career. Again, uh, joined the Navy in 1980 while a student at Texas A&M. He served on four Pearl Harbor based submarines: the Bremerton, the Omaha, the Tunney and commanded the USS Key, Key West. Okay, and that was early, in the beginning of the 2000 dec decade there. And uh, he has been on 10 deployments and four Navy unit commendations, five meritorious unit commendations and four battle efficiency E awards. Uh, Key West was the first warship to arrive off Pakistan following the 911 attacks. So he also commanded uh, here in Pearl Harbor, the Naval was yeah was Pearl Harbor Naval Submarine Training Center. Submarine Training Center. Yeah. His final active duty assignment was Director of Maintenance and Materials Readiness for Commander Submarine Forces in the uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet. And I did want to I, I glossed over something here. While uh, participating in Enduring Freedom, he was involved with launching Tomahawk cruise missiles into Afghanistan. Chuck was awarded the Defense uh, Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, uh, three times, Bronze Star, two awards, Notorious Service Medal, two awards, and the, uh, four Navy Commendation Medals and a Navy Achievement Medal. And today, Chuck is going to talk to us about the Bowfin from its beginnings to to where it is right now in this in this great uh, museum park that we have, and uh, I'll I'll let Chuck uh, start from here. All right. Well, thank you very much. As Sam said, I'm the executive director of the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum, and uh, with the reopening of our museum last February, we changed the name of the property from USS Bowfin Submarine Museum and Park to Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum to more reflect what we're, what we're doing there today. So we'll talk a little bit about the development of the Fleet Submarine, which was our submarine during the World War II era, how it was developed, what its capabilities were, and the history of USS Bowfin and submarine force in World War II. If there's any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. We can just do those as we go along. I'll just keep this informal. All right, so our submarine force started in 1900 with the purchase of the USS Holland. 
And uh, so submarines evolved fairly quickly to early in the, in the 20th century. And it's pretty amazing that the fleet submarine, which was our submarine during World War II, was really matured and designed in the 1930s. So nearly 90 years ago was when this, this ship started to be developed. So at the bottom of this slide, it shows a basic cutaway of what the, what the submarine looked like, fleet submarine. So there were eight compartments along the main part of the pressure hull, which was actually 16 feet in diameter. Started with the forward torpedo room. And then the next compartment was called the forward battery because the one of the two main ship's batteries was below, below the decks. Other things in that compartment were the staterooms, the wardroom, and the ship's office. The next compartment was the operations compartment. And that's where the main helm station, navigation station, radio room. Beneath that was a called the pump room where all the auxiliary equipment, air conditioning, hydraulics, air compressors were located. And at the aft end of that compartment then was that went into the galley and, and then the aft battery. So there was galley and a mess decks and then the after battery and above the aft battery was the main berthing area for the ship's crew. The next uh, space was uh, engine room, forward engine room. That engine room had two diesel generators and the water, the distilling equipment to make fresh water. And the next compartment was the aft engine room, another two diesel generators. And below decks was also a small auxiliary generator. So if all of the four main engines were needed for propulsion, they could at least charge the batteries. The next compartment was the maneuvering room and all the energy generated by the diesel engines came into that maneuvering cube and the electricians direct that to either charge the batteries or they control the main motors to turn the two shafts based on orders for speed. And then finally, there's the aft torpedo room, four more torpedo tubes and could carry a total of eight weapons in that room. And then uh, go back up to the sail area, immediately above the operations compartment was the conning tower. And that was a smaller eight foot diameter pressure hole. And all the equipment to carry out the attacks was up in that small compartment. That's uh, not normally open on the public route on this submarine tour, but we have a conning tower from another submarine, the USS Parchi, on our ground. So you can get a feel for what it's like up there. The periscopes are operated up in that space. The torpedo data computer, the radars and the sonar system were all operated up there. A little bit about the mission was, so why was this called a fleet submarine? Coming into the, in late in the 19th century, the vision, one of the leading doctrinal writers of naval warfare was Alfred Thayer, Mayor Ann, and their main philosophy was that fleets would gather and conduct a big, conclusive, decisive naval battle. And as that doctrine developed with the submarines, the vision of the submarines was they would act as scouting ships and direct the main battle force to engage the other enemy. And the submarines were then envisioned to then be left to pick up the pieces. Um, it really was fairly flawed tactic. I think the really the last time they tried to use that extensively was the Battle of Midway. There were a lot of submarines around Midway during that battle. And, uh, a couple of them ran aground. Um, one submarine conducted some torpedo launches, but submarines really weren't involved at all in that battle. And submarines were better off operating independently. A little bit about the specs that the submarine, the fleet submarine had, it could carry up to 110 gall 110,000 gallons of diesel fuel, give it a range of about 15,000 miles. Carry 24 torpedoes and carry food for about a 60 day loadout. I think the thing to really mention here is the snorkel had not really been developed. If you look at the aft end of the sail area on that diagram, there's a kind of a mushroom looking valve. That right there, you got it. That was the main induction valve. It wasn't very high off the surface of the water, 
but that's what brought the fresh air in when the submarine was on the surface so that the diesels could run. So anytime the submarine was submerged, the, all of the loads in the ship were from the energy in the batteries. The batteries were either charging or discharging. Got a lot of, a lot of cycles. Fleet submarine was 312 feet long. Uh, the ballast tanks wrapped around the pressure hull, so our beam was 27 feet. And there shows the displacement surfaced and submerged. Uh, initially, the fleet submarines had a test depth of 300 feet. And with starting with hole number 285 and beyond, of which Bofin was 287, had a test depth of 400 feet. During the war, there, there are many, many documented cases of these submarines going well below that test depth. Bofin on, has on record of at least 650 feet. I already mentioned uh, 10 21 inch, 20 inch torpedo tubes, six in the bow and four in the stern. And you really needed to think about this submarine as a small surface ship that could submerge for brief periods of time. Submerged endurance about really designed to stay submerged during hours of daylight and then spend the night on the surface. But during the war, there were several documented events where submarines were submerged for 36 hours or so, but they were in dire straits at that point when they, when they had to get up. So I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about the concept of unrestricted warfare. Uh, really, this was a case of the, of the rules of warfare lag the technology of developments of the early 20th century, airplanes and submarines. Prior to, prior to those developments uh, the, in warfare, a submarine suspected of carrying contraband or that sort of thing could be stopped by a warring party, boarded and inspected. And if it was carrying contraband, it could have been claimed as a war prize, the crew would have been taken off, could have been sunk, those sorts of things. Well, it was kind of hard to, or an airplane to collect the, path, the crew of a ship. There's certainly no room on a submarine to do that sort of thing. And, you know, Germany started this with the unrestricted warfare that led to us going into World War I when they executed unrestricted warfare. Uh, between the two wars, the U.S.'s official policy was always against unrestricted warfare. And, but shortly after the attack here on December 7th, message went out to the fleet, execute against Japan unrestricted air and submarine warfare. So I think we had realized that if we were going to get into this war, it was going to have to be waged with these new rules, and this was all set in place. There have been several books that have talked about this, but quite literally within hours of the attack, this message went out. But what we did find was that, like the rest of our armed forces going into World War II, we really weren't ready to go fight this war. So in our, in our museum, we have a display that talks a little bit about failure of tactics and command, but I also added leadership in here as I developed those, these slides. So in the years leading up to, to World War II, most of the exercises were very simplistic exercises that really favored the surface forces. So the conclusions and what we thought we learned from those various uh, events were really faulty. And crews had not been trained in realistic situations. They weren't ready to go. We had not tested our weapons. And uh, there were, we'll get to that in the next another slide, but we went into the war with weapons that were defective in several different ways, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. So when, uh, although here in, here in Hawaii, most of the, the submarine base wasn't uh, damaged, the submarines that were here at Pearl Harbor weren't damaged, and before the end of 1941, our, our submarines from here, as well as the submarines around the Philippines, went out on their early war patrols. But they went out unprepared. They were told to, to travel at most uh, economical speed or at a one engine speed. When you've got to travel five or 6,000 miles to get to your patrol area at that speed, it takes half of your patrol time to get there. Uh, once you get there, you can only stay a little while and then you've got to start coming back. They were told to stay submerged during daylight hours, regardless of where they were. So 
again, with those limits on how they could only go very slowly, they had to save the battery. If you're only putting two feet of periscope out of the water, you're only seeing a couple miles of the horizon, the chances of seeing a contact are very, very low. And then if they were happy, luckily enough to get into position, they often found that their weapons didn't work when they made an attack. And they came back uh, to Pearl Harbor and to Australia and reported in these disappointing results and the flag officers there pointed their finger at them and said, you guys are all messed up. How can this be? So I really, it was really a failure of leadership of not having a grit, having having the submarine force ready to go. And uh, this bullet, I added at the end of this slide that you know our next conflict will become as you are. We're not gonna have time to build 200 submarines. We're not gonna have time to train crews. We've gotta have our tactics ready to go and our weapons ready. So the Mark 14 torpedo was our, was our primary weapon at the beginning of the war. Here's a cutaway section of the Shows the weapon, the, the nose section is warhead with exploder. Most of the main body was an air tank that was charged at 2,000 pounds. And then as you move through the after body, there was a turbine engine, a fuel tank, and uh, the steering and depth mechanisms in the back. And if you go kind of in the midpoint of the air flask at the very top, that's, that's called a guide stud. So when the weapon is loaded into the tube, there was a, that locked the weapon and retain, restrained it in the torpedo tube. And there were actually mechanical shafts that then connected to the after body that allowed the crew, all you could really set on this weapon was the speed, high or low, the running depth. And then the, the final thing that was controlled right up until the moment of fire was the course that the weapon would then steer after it left the tube. Other than that, once it was gone, it was no controlling, it, ran, it went out to its course and it ran until it ran out of fuel or it hit something. This 2,000 pound, oh, go ahead. If the fuel is air. Well, there was air and there was alcohol fuel. So the air helped get the, got that turbine motor running and alcohol fuel ran the, ran the engine. There was an air spun gyro, that was the course mechanism. But uh, that weapon, then that air had to go somewhere and actually exhaust it out of the, the stern of the weapon. So it left a bubble trail behind it as it went through the water. So during daylight hours on a really calm day, that was visible. So there were a number of issues with these weapons. First, the, the depth control and sensing was wrong. So the weapons actually ran deeper than what the setting was. And we had developed a, a magnetic influence exploder. Um, I'll call it an idea ahead of its time. So in theory, it would be highly desirable for the weapon to, to detonate beneath the target, create a air bubble and break the back of the ship. It would cause more damage. Great idea, but that wasn't adequately tested. It had a lot of defects. All the other navies tried this at the time and gave up on it. But ours had been uh, designed by an admiral, so it couldn't possibly have anything wrong with it. And he was one of the submarine force commanders in the Pacific, and he ordered his submarines not to disable that. I think a lot of them still did anyway. Eventually, it was recognized that that was defective and it was taken out of service, but it took a while. There was also a defect in the contact exploder. And there were many, many documented instances where the submarine saw the torpedo hit the ship. They heard a, what they thought was an explosion. It was probably really the air flask blowing up. And Japanese ships literally pulled into port with some of our weapons stuck in the sides. And so to, to figure out what was going on with that contact exploder, we took a weapons over to off of Kahol Ave and launched them into the cliffs. And when those uh, didn't, some of those didn't detonate, the uh, divers went in and recovered them. Those were some pretty brave men. 
and it was determined that there was a there was a small piece in that contact exploder that had to travel perpendicularly to the velocity path of the weapon and it was made out of steel and it was too heavy so when the weapon you know decelerated in the in the contact that wouldn't travel its path and make the contact needed to detonate the weapon they so made that piece out of aluminum and we were in business so the on submarine base there's a pool behind the admiral's office by the horseshoe barracks and they actually that's where they tested those exploders lifted the weapons up and dropped them into the pool to make sure that was going to work so they also so that took about a year and a half of the war to sort out all these issues with this weapon i added a fifth defect here was anti-circular run um, there were at least two known instances of when our weapons were fired they failed the steering mechanism failed and the weapon circled and hit the shooting submarine we know of at least two because there were survivors from those two events, the, the Tullaby and the Tang. So a little bit about the, the USS Bofin dates and statistics. So she was built in Portsmouth Naval Shipyard up in New Hampshire or Kittery, Maine, whichever state you might wanna, wanna argue where that, where that shipyard is located. Laid down on uh, July 23rd, launched on December 7th, 1942. So she was given the nickname the Pearl Harbor Avenger. Commissioned in May of 43, and as soon as she was ready, she uh, headed to the Pacific, initially to Australia. Can't imagine that voyage from the East Coast of the United States to Australia. It's a pretty, uh, pretty long trip. Uh, did her first five war patrols out of, out of Australia. And that normally took about a year to do those five patrols of, for our submarines. And at that point, the batteries were pretty worn out. There was some stuff that needed to be fixed. So typically after five patrols, our ships came back to the West Coast and did a refit period. Uh, she did her final four patrols out of Pearl Harbor and Guam. Her ninth war patrol was in the sea. She went into the Sea of Japan with eight other submarines. And uh, we hadn't sent any of our submarines in the Sea of Japan since October of 43, the last submarine that went in there was sunk on her way out. It was the USS Wahoo. And it was a vision of the submarine force commander, Admiral Lockwood, to send submarines back into the Sea of Japan before the end of the war. By the end of 1944, Japanese merchant fleet was really, really decimated. Not very much left. And uh, so it was... Sea of Japan was really considered the last bastion of the, of the Japanese submarine for merchant traffic. So we sent those eight submarines through the Straits of Tsushima, submerged, and then and there were minefields. So they had a high frequency sonar they used to get in. They dispersed across the Sea of Japan, and at a set date and time, they all started executing attacks as a shock and awe attack. Those so submarines then all exited the Sea of Japan together and came back here to Pearl Harbor. On July 4th, 1945, and Bofin was actually on her way west again for another war patrol when Japan surrendered. She turned around and came back to, to Pearl Harbor, and this is a picture of her crew just before she left uh, to head back to the mainland in late August 1945. We just lost our last uh, crew member in that picture. He was 101 years old. So the, this is one of the submarine piers that's not there anymore, the, the finger piers. But she's flying her battle flags for all the claimed sinkings. And she's flying a homeward bound pennant. And by, and that's from the, yeah, those are the sinking flags. And then on the, the aft antenna is a homeward bound pennant. And that's one foot long for every crew member on board. And by tradition, that's cut up into one foot pieces and given to each crew member. And we have a handful of those in our collection in museum. Pretty neat. The captain at the time for the end of the war was a guy by the name of Alex Tyree. He went on to retire as a captain, was a college professor. We had him talking in one of our old audio tours. 
and we've had people come through the museum that recognize his voice and said he, they were he was their math teacher. <laughs> pretty, pretty interesting. So the Bofin came back to the United States, came back into the East Coast, and was then decommissioned in February of 1947. Got recommissioned and came back to the West Coast during the Korean War. And then after the Korean War, she was finally decommissioned. She was a, a Naval Reserve training ship on Lake Union up in Seattle through the 60s. And then in the early 70s, she was towed out here to Hawaii to be scrapped or sunk as a target. But uh, our, our association was founded in 1978 with the Navy League as a sponsor and with the help of Center in Noe, other members of our congressional delegation at the time. In 1979, she was donated to the association. Went through quite a bit of work to clean her up, but put on public display at Pearl Harbor in 81. And just last December, we celebrated our 10 millionth visitor. So she'll be 80 years this uh, December, and her longest service has been as a museum ship. Tell me a little bit about technology here that uh, we had in World War II, some of the developments as, as time went along. So the fleet submarine, as I mentioned, was, was pretty well suited for the, the war we fought out here in the Pacific, had the legs, had the speed, had the payload, and we just really needed to get the tactics and training down to learn how to operate that ship. Going into the war, the big advantage we had all over, over all the other submarine forces was the torpedo data computer. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Norden bomb site um, that was claimed to have some accuracy to it, but I think this was a much more accurate device in that regard. Up until this device was developed, uh, the submarines had to manually calculate the course for the torpedo to steer after it left the tube. And they basically had to, to maneuver to a firing position and then shoot. So if the contact you were trying to shoot maneuvered at any time in that process, you had to start all over again. With this device, all they had to do was dial this new solution in, and as long as it was in the limits, they could engage the target. So it gave us a lot more flexibility. So we, most of the successful attacks were inside a thousand yards. So you really had to have a accurate weapon. You had to have a good day. Some of your errors had to be pluses, some of them had to be minuses. Um, there was some art to operating this device. And normally they would shoot three weapons. One to lead, one to be a little behind what they thought the actual solution, and one right at the actual solution. If it was a bigger, higher value target, they might shoot four weapons or even six weapons if it was an aircraft carrier. They really had to be in the right place at the right time to engage a warship because of the speed they could operate at. But this device enabled us a lot, gave us a lot of capability. Is that mechanical or is that electromechanical? It's electromechanical. So with this device was located up in the conning tower and they used uh, basically the captain's periscope observations if they were able to use the radar, they could get a more accurate range of the contacts. They would pick the contact they were going to shoot. They would dial in its solution, so the course it was operating on, its speed, and then the range. And then uh, the TDC would calculate the torpedo course and would give them an indication of when it was within the limits of, of the engagement. You were really better off pointing the submarine where you wanted the torpedo to go because anything, any of that turn introduced the advance and transfer as well, right? So the more, the less you made that course change, the more likely you were going to hit the target. Who figured out, uh, I guess, the range, but also the course the target was on? So the range they would use, so the reticle of the 
periscope had graduations on it, right? So they would they would observe the number of graduations shown on the that they could see of the contact in the periscope window. And then they would make an estimate of the the height, what they call a masthead height of the of the ship. So based on that assumed masthead height and then the, the number of divisions they saw of the contact, that would calculate a range. And for aspect, they had a number of models that were built. So if you can see half of the ship, so angle on the bow is relative to if the contact's pointed directly at you, the angle on the bow is zero. If it's directly away, it's 180. If it's completely broadside, it's 90 degrees in either direction. So if, it, if you can see half of the ship, what's the angle on the bow? Uh, whether it's coming toward you. Or well, coming away. towards you, coming towards you. No, it's a sinusoidal, it's a sinusoidal function. So you, you see half of it, it's 30 degrees. So the, the guys who got really good at that would sit in the wardroom at one end of the wardroom table, which is longer than these tables. Maybe this, these two smaller tables was the size of the wardroom. Pantry over here with a turntable with these small models. And they would rotate that around and then they would look at the contact and they would practice being able to judge that. So that's a real skill. You have to think. Yeah, you would think, oh, I see half of it is 45. No, it's 30. So that's so it was a so there was a lot of art involved still with the periscope. The radar, if they were able to use it, would give them a more accurate range, and then they could calculate, they could calibrate their masthead height and then get more accurate range calculations just with the periscope. They would also, you know, most of the merchants that they were firing torpedoes against, there were fairly limited speed, 10 knots back in that era was a high speed merchant. So they could judge by the wake on the side of the ship, how fast it was going and that sort of thing. They would just take positions over time and they could also calculate a speed or get a speed estimate. Lots of different things. That's why they bracketed. Right, that's right, <laughs> absolutely. So radar, we went into the war, we had radar. It took a little while to, to gain confidence in using it. But I mentioned earlier at the, at the beginning of the war, the guides would stay submerged during daylight hours. Uh, but what, are, what the submarine commanders, the more aggressive ones came to figure out is, if we're gonna be successful, we need to be on the surface unless we're really threatened. So they put a lot of faith in their lookouts. They were trained, they trained the lookouts, they rotated them. These were, you know, some of these kids were 16, right? Um, uh, the Mark I, Mod I eyeball was, was the protection. And there were at least one of those lookouts up on the bridge during the day had very thick glasses so he could look at the sun to watch for airplanes come out of the sun. They also put faith in the radar and being able to detect planes before they got too close. And then they practiced being able to submerge their submarine if they felt threatened in under a minute. Uh, we don't do that with our nuclear submarines. Uh, so normal, the normal routine, if they had been submerged during the day, when the sun went down, they would come, and if it was clear, they would surface. They'd get the diesel engines running, get the batteries charging. And then with that energy, they could also run the air compressors to recharge their air banks. They could start making fresh water. The, the fresh water units were electric stills. So they heated salt water up to about 160, 170 degrees, had it at a partial vacuum so it would flash. And then they just, collect the distillate, and that was their fresh water. The number one product for fresh water was to keep the batteries water. Number two was a uh, galley. And don't ask me where showers for lunch of the crew was. It was way down the list. But, you know, they get fresh water made. So all those things are going on during the nighttime hours. And then the goal then was before the sun was up in the morning, they would... Uh, in a controlled manner, they would submerge the ship and check its buoyancy. So you always want to have the ship when it's submerged 
trimmed so that it's neutrally buoyant underwater so that it doesn't sink or doesn't float up. And they would check that trim, make sure it was all set. And if they were gonna stay on the surface end to uh, continue their search on the surface during the day, they go back up on the surface. But then that next time a dive would be ordered during the day, it would be an emergent dive. And those orders uh, set in motion, you would normally make sure all your hatches and valves are shut before you open the vents on the ballast tanks. But on that emergent dive, those vents were open and you relied on the training and practice to get all those things done. And, uh, so that was why they stayed on the surface. We developed a camouflage paint scheme. You don't see many pictures of submarines, but you do see some of the surface ships that show different colors and shapes on the hulls. So it was made it difficult to figure out what you were looking at. We developed the high frequency active sonar for minefields. Uh, we reverse engineered a battery powered torpedo from the Germans. So the batteries basically replaced that big air flask and electric motors. It was slower and had a smaller range, but it worked. It didn't leave a bubble trail. And we also developed a small torpedo called a Cutie, and it was designed, you know, one of it to be launched from an aft torpedo tube to sink a destroyer that might be overhead dropping depth charges. So it'll be launched. It was a battery powered weapon. It would circle up and it had a passive acoustic sensor and it would go up and hopefully take out that destroyer that was on top of it. So that was a evasion weapon. Bofin uh, claims to have sunk a destroyer in that manner. We'll talk a little bit here. The you know, submarine force was only 2% of our Navy in World War II. Nearly 1,700 war patrols sank over 5 million tons of Japanese shipping, which was 55% of the vessels sunk. But that success came at a cost. We lost 52 submarines and over 3,500 men. Uh, this picture is of the mural in our in the entryway of our new museum, and it's made up of the 4,000 pictures of the 4,000 men who died serving our submarine force. And there's also a kiosk where you can learn a little bit about each one of those men. So I thought it would be interesting to compare uh, a fleet submarine of World War II to one of our modern submarines. So on the left-hand side is Bofin's statistics compared to that of USS Hawaii, one of our Virginia-class submarines here, now based here at Pearl Harbor. So the pressure hole on the Bofin was 16 feet in diameter. Uh, the pressure hole for the Hawaii is 16 feet, or is 34 feet in diameter. And the, the ballast tanks on our modern ships are now in the, at the ahead at the bow and the stern of the ship. They don't wrap around the outside of the submarine. Uh, we actually have less, we only have about a 10% reserve buoyancy on our modern submarines compared to what we had on our World War II submarines. Nuclear propulsion obviously revolutionized the, the whole thing. Not worried about uh, underwater endurance anymore. Test depth authorized to say eight on up to 800, more than 800 feet. But very interestingly, our torpedo tubes are still 21 inches in diameter. Uh, Hawaii has 12 vertical launch tubes for Tomahawk cruise missiles as well. So basically, our modern weapons are about the same size as what the World War II weapon. Today, as it has been since 1960, our Navy's and our military's highest priority is strategic deterrence. So if you're familiar with what the nuclear triad is, you've heard that term before, some of you have. It's our ballistic missile submarines, our inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, land-based forces, and then our airborne strategic forces. I think it's long recognized that our submarines are the most survivable strategic asset. Probably what most people don't know is that since 1960, our nation has had ballistic missile submarines 
on patrol continuously. So any day, any given day, there are a number of submarines out in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, their exact position known only to those on board, and their sole mission is to stay out there and hope they never get that message that calls them into action. We built 18. Uh, initially, our SSBNs, we built 41 of those, among them the USS Kamehameha. Um, we built 18 Ohio-class submarines, and uh, the first four of those were converted to carry conventional cruise missiles at the end of the Cold War. And 14 of those are continuing to carry out that strategic mission. We started construction on a new Columbia class SSBN. Pieces and parts of that are coming together. It's going to have the Ohio class had 24 missile tubes and the Columbia class is going to have 16 missile tubes of the same size as what the Ohio class carried. 16. 16. 16. 16. <clears throat> and uh, we'll be retiring those Ohio class submarines here in the, in the not too far distant future. It's pretty amazing those submarines will operate for 42 years. So the rest of our submarines, we have four, four of those Ohio class submarines that were converted to carry Tomahawk cruise missiles. So in the place of where one uh, strategic missile might have been carried, they can carry seven Tomahawks. So they can carry in 22 of the 24 tubes. The other two tubes are configured to carry special forces and carry the dry dock shelters. So we've got four of those, two in each uh, ocean. We built 62 Los Angeles class submarines, 27 of them are still active. We built three Seawolf class submarines. There were supposed to have been about 20 of those, but when the Cold War came along or ended, there were, those were too expensive to keep building. And uh, the Connecticut was in the news here not too long ago. That was the submarine that ran aground out in the South China Sea. I don't know anything about what the details of all that are. She's back at her home port in uh, Bremerton and they're taking a look at whether she can be repaired and returned to service. And uh, we've built 22 Virginia class submarines. Um, depending on where you look, we may build up to 48 or up to 66 of those submarines. So they'll be on service really for most of the rest of this century as those get built out. There is talk of building a follow on. Oh, go ahead. Those are all attack submarines. Yes, yes. As the four Ohio SSGNs come off of service, um, the most recent uh, Virginia class that are being built are being built with an additional 85 to 90 foot piece in the hull. It will carry those that will carry four launch tubes that can carry tomahawks or bigger weapons. It'll replace those four guided missile submarines. Those will start to come on service. The first one of those with that capability is named the Arizona. It's named fairly recently. But when you say bigger weapons, uh, the, the ICBM is a pretty big. Yeah, it won't weapon. carry that. It won't carry that size of a weapon, but. You could vision some sort of, you know, I don't, hypersonic weapon or, or some sort of undersea vehicle could be launched for those twos, that sort of thing. Getting close to one o'clock. Okay, I, I see. We got two more slides. Two more slides. So I, I just kind of highlighted some of the technology since World War II. You'd already mentioned the snorkel. The Dutch had actually developed that. The Germans stole it from the Dutch, and then we stole it from the Germans at the end of the war nuclear propulsion and the ballistic missile, those were the two things the submarine force brought to the Cold War. So if you come to our, our new uh, museum, you'll see in the Cold War, we highlight nuclear propulsion and the ballistic missile and how that contributed to keeping the Cold War cold. Um, modern submarines, the whole design development, the quieting, the sensors, um, the sonar on the bowfin was like putting a tin cup over your ear and spinning around and trying to hear. Um, 
the submarines I served on, uh, the sonar dome was 16 feet in diameter and had about 1,200 hydrophones on it. So you could listen all around and you had video displays to help cue you. Uh, open architecture on the Virginia. So most of the uh, electronic spaces forward of the ship, so sonar and combat system, uh, just equipment racks. So if they want to upgrade, it's very easy. They just take out the old computers, put in the new computers, and it's very easy to upgrade those systems. The Virginia class brought fly-by-wire technology into the submarines. Uh, every submarine I served on, uh, the guy steering and doing the depth control were the most junior guys on the ship. Now it's a senior enlisted position called a pilot and a co-pilot. Uh, Non-penetrating periscope. All my submarines had regular optical periscopes that had a barrel that had to come out from the hull. The Virginia class, they're cameras so that that mass doesn't penetrate down into the hull. And the periscope operator sits at a desk and he's got a joystick and he toggles around and he looks. I guess if you're from that video generation, you probably are not comfortable with that. I never served on a submarine like that. I rode them. And it was very interesting, very different. And then communications. I mean, our, our in World War II, we were HF for long range communications and VHF for close tactical. Now we operate from extra low to extra high frequency for communications in various ways. Yeah, so just a little quick bit about the association I hit, hit on, founded in 1978. We had the BOFIN donated in 79 and then 81. Um, the museum opened in 1988, and we inherited the museum that was on the base. All of the stuff came over to us, and we just finished a $20 million renovation in February of last year. So the museum was expanded. The entire interior of the museum was redone. So if you haven't been there in the last year, you haven't been to the museum. I encourage you to come see it. That's it. Okay, uh, anybody online, if you have a question, unmute. Uh, we'll have a couple of questions, but it's right at one o'clock. So uh, if you have any questions, let us uh, unmute and ask your question. Is this, a, this is at the, the museum, right? Down by, by the Arizona Memorial? Yes, yeah, just right down in there. We share a parking lot and, and visitor entrance. Um, the general admission is $21.99. There's a comma INA rate as well, so, or, or veterans rate, military rate. Hey. So, oh. so certificate of oh. appreciation for all right. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very to much. To today. Thanks. Thank I really appreciate it. it. Yeah, great. good. Glad to do it. I hope you hope that learned yeah. something from all that. Thank you. Just come and come and take a look. Do they let women on submarines? Yes, they do. They do. They do. But I guess it's about 10 years ago now that, that women started serving on submarines. So they've, you know, your basic, basic progression in your in career path is there's four tours. So you start as a, as your first tour is about three years where you qualify and learn and operate a division of anywhere from five to 15 men, men or women. And your next tour then is called the department head tour. So you'd be responsible for about a third of the ship, engineering, operations, or weapons, and about a third of the crew. Um, at every level, there's a screening. So at the end of your department head tour, you should uh, finish qualification for command and you go through a screening. Um, and if you pass that screening, then you go on to be the executive officer or second in command. So you really responsible to the captain for the operation of the entire ship. Get through that tour, then you uh, go through another screening process and select it for command. And at each level, there's training. Uh, the most training that is when you go off to command, there's about nine months of training, uh, about three months at the Navy training, learning Navy nuclear propulsion program, learning specifically about the reactor and propulsion plan of the ship you're gonna command. Then there's three months of tactical training and then other things along the way. So women will, within the next year, there will be a woman XO on summary. And uh, so we're not that far away from command. 
They're doing quite well. They've started with officers first, and they brought him in as a cadre of three. You need to, to have that critical mass. And as they brought integrated the enlisted side, they brought in more. So they've recruited some chiefs that were mid-level. So a lot of initially were probably yeomen or corpsmen or that sort of rating. But then they had at least had some women chiefs on board. And then the, you know, the junior enlisted came in. But they're doing well. There have been issues. But there, and if there have been any misbehaviors. They've been pretty uh, quickly handled, and it's been pretty strict, strict enforcement of policies. Are they still hot bunk? Yes. They didn't have snorkels. No. So they get the air that they're breathing is when they're on the on the surface, whatever comes into the sun. That's right. At the end of some of those long days, their indications that the air was getting bad was uh, their cigarettes wouldn't stay there. <laughs> So you can take a tour, start at the Wolf Inn and go to the Missouri and yes, the Air Air Museum too. Yes, all of it for yep. one price. Yeah, there, we sell. There's a combination package that you can buy that to do that, and the shuttle bus runs right from our grounds to get out to Fort Island. It's a full day if you go do all of it at once. So, but we're a 501c3, and everything we. Uh, Everything goes into operating and maintaining the boat. Uh, we're going to go into dry dock this uh, fall, first time in 18 years. So uh, that's a pretty. Some of those things growing on the hull are probably in danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you wait? I was going to ask. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, okay. It's, the meeting is officially over. Uh, we'll, we'll stay here for a few minutes. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comments in this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com.